so last week we had a look at this. It's an Elector Formant. It's a synthesizer that you could build month by month with monthly subscriptions of the Elector magazine. It was quite a popular DIY project of the time and it sounds pretty good. In that video I mentioned that there are a load of electronic synthesizer DIY projects from around this era. And we're going to be looking at another one of those today. It's Charles Blakey's Digisound 80 project. The Digisound 80 DIY modular series started in February 1980. And it was a very successful project that was covered in Electronics Today International. Some of the later projects were covered in Maplin's very own Electronic and Music Maker as well. But it basically meant if you subscribed to Electronics Today International and you were up for a bit of soldering, you could build your own Digisound 80. Most of the modules were based around Curtis and SSM chips, which were found in a lot of synthesizers of the time, including Roland Jupiter 6s, SH101s, Oberheims, to name a few. So you already knew that it was going to sound comparable to some of these synths. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to get hold of a Digisound 80 synthesizer. Josh, who makes really good musical instruments under the name Crucifix, sent me a message. Unfortunately, I only saw the message about 15 hours later. It was a link to a Facebook Marketplace post. And because I was 15 hours late, I figured it was probably already gone. But I sent a message to the seller anyway, sending my number and mentioning that I could pick it up within the next couple of days. Lo and behold, about six hours later, I got a phone call from Gordon, who was the seller, who mentioned that all of the people who were interested before me either backed out or stopped responding and wondered if I could pick it up in the next couple of days if so it's mine so a couple of hours later I jumped in the car and started driving five hours to go and pick it up Gordon was the builder of this synthesizer and it was being sold as a project but first before we delve into that synthesizer let's have a closer look at the Digisound 80 series let's begin this story with Electronics Today International February 1980 it introduces you to the modular synthesizer and what you're about to build as well as the designs for the power supply and a VCO module this VCO module is based on the Curtis 3340 chip which were also found in these synthesizers as well as the Cosmo module. It also shows you the schematic as well as the circuit board design so you can build your own oscillator but this also is able to be cross changed to be a voltage controlled low frequency oscillator with a couple of changes of resistors and capacitors so with a different panel and a couple of changes you can have an LFO as well. Then we jump straight over to March 1980 and we're going to ignore that rather dashing looking metal detector and we're going to jump straight over to the this page which has the voltage controlled mixer. This is based around the Curtis 3330 chip which is for VCA's voltage controlled amplifiers. They're set up in a way that you're able to have a voltage controlled mixer with control voltage over the panning as well. How beautiful is that? It's also got bipolar gain adjustments and a peak level indicator but also in this magazine article is the processor which would be perfect to control multiple VCOs. Now we're on to May 1980. Let's ignore the Transcendent 2000 and the black hole chorus pedal and jump straight over to to the filter page. This issue shows you how a filter works as well as how to practically use a Curtis 3320 chip to either make a low pass filter, a high pass filter or a band pass filter. In this instance we've got a VCFL which is a low pass filter but you could easily adjust it to become a band pass or a high pass and you could just change the letter on the top of the module. Ooh. Next up in July 1980 we have two modules starting with the state variable filter which is based on the SSM 2040 which is harking back to the days of the digital sound 20. You, this one has a load of different filters all in one, including high pass, low pass, a load of different poles, this, that and the other. It's pretty mental. And then also in this magazine issue is an envelope generator, which is also based on an SSM chip, which is short for solid state music or micro technology. It depends which way you look at it. But this is the 2050 and it came in a dual package, which means you get a dual ADSR. Attack, decay, sustain and release. And you can flick it over to an, just an attack decay if you really want to. This would be perfectly fine for our Envelope generating needs. In September 1980, we get straight back to the Curtis chips with the envelope shaper that is voltage controlled using the Curtis 3310, which is also from a bunch of polysymps of the time. But this means we have voltage control all over all of those wiggly wiggly knobs. And as you can see, it's a bit more of a chunky design. There's a bit more going on. Also around this time, the dual VCA came out, which was in electronics and music maker in August 1980. I think I haven't got a copy of it. But as you can see, this is based on the 3330 and there is also the dual ring modulator which was a special at some point as well and that is based on SSM chips yet again you're starting to see a trend right April 1981 that's right we're going to ignore that power tran transcendent polysynth for only £320 for the kit we're going to look at the noise and sample and hold generator this is pretty sample by sample I mean simple it's got a sample and hold white noise pink noise all of the noises you need it's just a very useful module but popping back to October 1980 we're going to get real loud with a modular amplifier that's right it's a modular amplifier for 
speakers. So it's got everything you need to basically get noise coming out of your modular into speakers. It's got a phone, it's got a left, it's got a right. It's also got its own built-in power supply. So you just need to send it AC signals. Anyway, we're going to jump straight over to April 9A2, which is the 10th birthday of Electronics Today International. And we're going to celebrate with a bucket brigade style reverberation module. As you can see, it's a nice sparse module. Uh, and it's, it sounds pretty damn good. It's based on a Mitsubishi bucket brigade chip. And it, yeah, it's going to wash out. You'll see later in the video. It sounds lovely. In January 1983, we're going to get the most out of our oscillators using the waveform multiplier, also known as a chorus. This is basically something that widens a single oscillator waveform, or you can plug in whatever you want. But if you look at that, it's got four cards, so you get a super wide one, but the dual chorus in our instance has a double widener. So as you can see, there's two exact boards and a driver board. So we're going to try that out. It's going to sound slurzy. But who can forget about the module that came out in July 1981's Electronic and Music Maker? It's the Alpha DAC 16. This is basically a Commodore PET 6502 style, you know, computer in your modular synth. It's able to have 16 voices. You can use it as a sequencer, arpeggiator, polyphonic synth controller. That is the keypad. It's a little bit clunky to use, and we're going to have a look at that at some point. But currently, the one that I've got isn't working. I've been trying to fix it. Look, trust me, trust me. I'll talk about it a little bit. Anyway, that was that was all of the synthesizers now. Well, let's go and have a look at the uh, one we've got anyway. Oh, I'm, I'm just blabbing. I've, I've forgotten what I'm talking about. Anyway, I'm going to... So now we're up to date with the Digisound 80 series. I'm aware I missed a couple, including the DRF, the external signal input, the original keyboard controller, to name a couple. But there are links below to some very good websites if you're interested in looking into it further. So the story with this Digisound 80 is Gordon put it together in around 1987. Very well, I must add. That's another thing. I do mention it in every single video about all of these DIY synthesizers that I get hold of. Is the quality of the build is completely up to who the heck has built it. And there's no way of really telling it when you're trying to purchase one of these things so you are somewhat taking a punt but luckily Gordon put this together really well. He said it ended up going in the loft in about 96 or 97 however I'd hazard a guess it was in September of 1997 because the newspapers that it was packaged in are all dated to then. There's even an echo Liverpool echo people's grave for Diana. I've got to say that these are fascinating in their own right. So this Digisound 80 synthesizer came with a bunch of extra modules. It had a synthesizer voice module which is another one that I didn't mention in the Digisound series. This one has not yet been fully wired up yet but we'll be making that at some point in the future because there's also circuit boards for another free Digisound synth voices so we can have four voices in its own rack to make a polyphonic synthesizer. Ooh! It also came with that massive chunky AlphaDAC 16 controller board as well as the original digital to analog converter which the AlphaDAC replaced as Gordon kept on updating the synthesizer. It also came with a few Curtis chips on top which is a good thing because I needed to replace a couple in the synthesizer module when I was repairing it. And it also came with a couple of unbuilt modules which we will be building in the future. All in all, the synthesizer outwardly was in good condition. There was a little bit of a bash on the side of a case but it's not too much to worry about. And the homemade keyboard case power supply situation going down at the bottom really tops off the whole project. So Gordon mentioned when he got out of the loft he gave it a test and the oscillators weren't sounding too happy. So the first thing I did was to check them out and see what he was talking about and yeah, they sounded pretty funky. <laughs> You know, so the first thought that came to mind was it was either a power supply issue or there was a module inside the synth that was being a little bit funky. So the first thing I did was take out all the modules and test the oscillator on its own. Lo and behold, the problem was still there. So I took apart the keyboard controller that had the power supply for the whole modular inside. Lo and behold, it wasn't sending out the correct voltages and it was all being a bit wiggly and wavy. So the first thing I did was swap the capacitors on the power supplies. The problem was still there, but luckily I had some spare 723 voltage regulators that these power supplies supplies used. These voltage regulators are quite renowned for being a little bit fragile so I swapped the one on the problem area of the power supply and lo and behold it started working as it was supposed to. The next thing I did was pretty much use two cans of contact cleaner on all of the potentiometers, jack sockets and switches. That took quite a while but it meant that all of them were starting to twist and work. It was quite important to do this because it was stored in a loft for 10 years and all of the potentiometers were starting to sound like your granddad's knees. <laughs> After that, I wired up the VCOs and they were working as they were supposed to. I 
like I mentioned, this DigiSound has the AlphaDAC 16, which can be used for a whole load of things, including being a polyphonic synthesizer controller. But the modular only had free voltage controlled oscillators. I figured it would be great if I could manage to get hold of another one so we could have it as four synth voices if I could get the AlphaDAC to work. I ended up asking around and an awesome person by the name of Jamie sold me another VCO. So I managed to get hold of it and plug it in. And now we've got four and yeah, it's pretty awesome. The next thing I turned to was the AlphaDAC 16. And sadly, this has defeated me right now. I've tried absolutely everything to try and get it working. And I've actually got to the conclusion that it might actually be working, but something else is up. So I'm gonna give that a little bit of a break. What I ended up doing was doing a little bit of work to make it work again with the original digital to analog converter. And then when I'm a little bit back with some energy for the AlphaDAC 16, we'll be doing another video and we'll be looking at that when it finally works. But after wiring up the original digital to analog converter that plugs into the keyboard controller, it showed that not all of the keys were working on the keyboard. So I had to completely pull apart the keyboard controller and get to the underside of the keyboard. And this reminded me of another thing that Gordon said. He mentioned how much of a pain in the bum it was to make the keyboard controller. You look at those little springs on there, he had to arrow die every single one of those onto those circuit boards. But yeah, after fixing a couple of dry joints there, every single one of the keys started working. Phew. After this, it was a case of putting the whole thing back together and testing the rest of the modules. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, I had to replace a few of the chips and a few of the modules to get them to work again. And a couple of them, like the chorus, are still not fully working and we'll have a look at those in the future. So I'm gonna go over and get it and we can see what sounds we can get out of it.
So that's it for today for the Digisound 80. The old digital to analog converter is only monophonic, so it was only monophonic today, but when we get the Alpha DAC working at some point, that will be able to go here, hence why there's two blanks, so it can just plop in. I'm quite looking forward to getting the Alpha DAC working because it can be an arpeggiator, it could be a sequencer, multi-track sequencer by the way, it can be a polyphonic synthesizer controller up to 16 voices. It's pretty massive and very impressive for the time. And it was from 1981, so it preceded the MIDI standard. It has an empty hole at the top for a cassette to load um, memory information. But we can easily add a MIDI socket there and actually build an interface that talks between MIDI and the Alpha DAC. Also, I feel that this is going to end up getting a couple more racks on top because we've got the synthesizer voices to build. I think I'm going to build a sequencer in the style of this as well, just to kind of add a bit more function to it. I primarily got hold of this, like I do with all of the old DIY synthesizers, for this museum's not obsolete. And you can actually go and play on this. In fact, the next out of season an open day is February the 26th and you can come and play on this it'll be sat next to the formant if you want to download a WAV file of the longer version of the jam at the end of this video well you can download it over on patreon and there's also a bunch of sounds and a sound pack that you could use that's from this amongst loads of other ones and you can also watch about five or six ten minute long vlogs uh, about this as I was fixing it up and stuff a lot of the footage that I used in this video was from all of the vlog updates anyway until next time I'm look mum no computer this is the digi sound 80 if you like what you see don't forget subscribing, don't be scared to try it.